Well, hello. I'm so glad you could join us today uh, for our New Testament survey here at our Faith Bible Institute at Faith Baptist Church in Lebanon. And uh, it's just been a challenge on one hand uh, to work through all this material and a blessing. Uh, just even though we're just gleaning the highlights of these different books, nonetheless, uh, even with just those simple gleanings to be able to receive just so much encouragement and, and many blessings and promises. And, and uh, so, yeah, a lot of food for thought, uh, even as we do this New Testament survey. But really glad you're able to join us here today as we're in the book of James. And uh, this is actually part two of the study. So if you didn't catch the first part, just uh, look on our church website and you'll be able to find James part one as far as the survey is concerned. Uh, today uh, we're on part two and we'll, Lord willing, be able to finish the study on James here today. But uh, let's go ahead and ask God's blessing as we dive into his word uh, today. Lord God, we thank you that yet uh, another day that you've given to us to be able to draw closer to you and to learn from you, Lord. And that is our heart's desire. As we open your word now and every time, Lord, we desire for you to teach us. Help us, Lord, to know you better, um, to ultimately love you more, and also, Lord, to be made more conformed to the image of Christ. And so, God, I pray that this study today would not be just an academic exercise, but that, Lord, you would truly speak to our hearts through the different highlights and truths that we'll be looking at. Help us, Lord, to grow in our faith, grow closer to you. Uh, help us to change, Lord, uh, that we might be able to truly honor you in every part of our lives. And so we ask your blessing now upon this time of study. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so what we'll do is just, uh, I'd like to just do a quick review of the outline of the book, which we saw last time, but I think I, think I mentioned last time that... Um, I just thought this is one of those outlines. It's not mine, okay? This is one I found. But it's just one of those outlines I just thought was well-worded um, and really just kind of uh, does a really adequate job of presenting the highlights of the book. So uh, just to go through quickly, uh, five chapters in the book of James, and so five parts to the outline based on each chapter. So first of all, chapter one, the theme or whatever, the title would be Stand with Confidence. And I like that because it's a dr Chapter 1 addresses especially the question of uh, diverse trials that we face in life, uh, temptations that come upon us, and so how we can stand with confidence uh, in the face of those challenges uh, of life. Then uh, chapter 2 deals with serving with compassion, and we saw the importance of accepting others, so that, that uh, it's the rejection of all partiality, and in the context of today, you know, any, any notion of racism or anything even close to that, uh, is to be rejected, is we're to accept all others as a de indeed made in the image of God, um, and then to assist others in, in a very practical way. And so, of course, James has a lot to say about the practice of the Christian faith, right? James chapter 2 is really big on that. Um, chapter 3, speak with care. And so a whole chapter devoted on, uh, devoted to the tongue, okay, and how we are to speak or not to speak, um, and so the need to control talk and the need to cultivate our thoughts according to wisdom, according to God's wisdom. All right, so speak with care. Chapter four, submit with contrition. And the main idea here is that we need to submit to God. And as we do that, um, he will enable us to turn our hostility into humility, our judgment into justice, and our boasting into into belief. And so again, I just love the way that that's, in so few words, it really captures the essence of that chapter. Chapter five, um, the title then would be Share with Concern. And James finishes the book here dealing with how we're to share in our possessions, share in patience, and finally share in prayer. And so the importance again of being able to lift up one another in prayer and to intercede on behalf of those who have various needs, both physical or spiritual. Okay, so that was kind of the, the outline of the book. And again, I think it's just worth, uh, it bears repeating, okay? Um, and then we start talking about some highlights, and we're not going to repeat this now. But in chapter 1, again, talking about uh, looking at different principles concerning trials and temptations in life. And so we're just going to pass over that and go on to chapter 2. Um, 
And basically, we're going to be looking at uh, some highlights from each chapter here in the study today. But in chapter 2, um, <clears throat> many see a contradiction, uh, especially in this chapter, between the teaching of Paul and the teaching of James. And the reason they say that is because James does insist on the practical aspect of faith um, and how that is a demonstration of genuine salvation, whereas Paul uh, seems to divorce the whole idea of works from faith and says that we're saved you know, purely by faith with no, um, no thought almost to works, which again, that's an overstatement. That's not exactly what Paul says. But um, so just to give you a, an example, in James chapter 2 and verse 24, James writes and says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Mm. So James says that we're justified by both faith and works, he says. Not by faith only, faith and works. Whereas if you recall, uh, for example, Paul in Ephesians, I don't know if I put it up here or not. Uh, I guess I didn't. But anyway, um, Paul uh, uses the statement in Ephesians where he says that by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So Paul makes it really clear that works do not contribute to our salvation, um, that we're saved by God's grace and through faith uh, alone. And so, again, there is... While there could appear to be a contradiction in those two verses we just read, okay, that seem to say opposite things. Um, clearly, the Bible is one, uh, the, the message of the Bible is unified, and so there is not a contradiction between Paul and James. Um, rather, they complement one another perfectly. And so, probably the difference um, between these uh, two, um, the writings of Paul and the writings of James, uh, could be explained best in this way. Um, so, first of all, James uh, uses the word faith throughout this book, especially chapter 2. James uses the word faith in the sense of intellectual orthodoxy. Okay, the idea that somebody would simply give intellectual consent to certain you know, biblical truths. And so, for example, he says in chapter 2, verse 19, You believe that there is one God, you do well, even the dem demons believe and tremble. I'll get that out. Even the demons believe and tremble, right? Um, so, James says that the demons believe. Well, if they believe, then they should be saved, right? No, because, again, James using the idea of faith or belief, same root word in Greek, he uses the word belief here and the idea that the demons acknowledge that God exists. They know intellectually that God exists, so they believe in his existence. It's just they have not exercised saving faith. There's not been any repentance and any change of heart or mind in the demons. And so it's possible to have a certain faith, a certain belief in God um, without truly being saved, without having saving faith, um, which, by the way, that, would, that was my case growing up. Okay, Growing up, I had a certain intellectual, acknowledge, uh, intellectual uh, uh, knowledge of God. Um, I didn't contest God's existence. To the contrary, I, I believe that God existed. And I believed a certain, things, a certain number of things about God, but I didn't know Him, and I, did, I certainly did not understand the whole message of salvation. And, um, and so even though I had a certain faith, belief in God, it was not saving faith. So, going back, so James uses the word faith here in his book to speak especially of intellectual orthodoxy, whereas Paul, when he uses faith in a personal sense in his different writings, he refer, he's referring to trust, somebody's trust, in the atoning work of Christ to the extent of full commitment to Him. All right, and that's by way of a, a, a quotation from Schofield, okay? But I like that distinction in the way Schofield words it, okay? So Paul uses faith in the sense of a trust in the atoning work of Christ to the extent of full commitment to Him. All right, so... So they're using the same word, but with a different emphasis, to be sure. Uh, also, Paul speaks of justification before God. When Paul talks about faith and justification, he's looking especially to our, our standing before God. So it's the spiritual side of our faith as viewed by God. 
while James describes justification mostly before man. He's taking a different perspective. He's not looking at God's perspective of us. He's talking about man's perspective of us. So when James talks about justification, he's looking at the practical side of our faith as viewed by men. And so in that sense, um, both James and Paul would agree that a mere profession of faith apart from evidence of works is not saving faith. Okay, again, say that. Um, a mere profession of faith apart from evidence of works, I think I have it written on here, yes it is, is not saving faith. And so Paul, I mean, James actually refers to that. He says in chapter 2, verse 14, he says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? All right. So James is talking about somebody who simply says that they have faith. Okay. There's a, there's a profession of faith, but it doesn't go beyond the, the lips or the mouth. Okay. It's not a heart uh, conversion that we're talking about. It's a simple profession of faith. And again, I'm sure you and I know people. And again, this was my, I'm not judging anybody else. This was me okay, for too many years of my life. But we all know people who make a profession to be Christians, make a profession to believe in God. And you, when you look at their life, I mean, there's, there's an obvious contradiction, okay? Um, in many t- cases, there's even an obvious, uh, a total misunderstanding of what the Christian faith is. Uh, simply because a person is raised in a Christian culture, a lot of times they consider themselves Christians because, while well, they're not Muslims and they're not Jews, you know, they're not Hindus, so therefore they're Christians. And uh, maybe they were baptized as a Christian, as a baby, you know? Um, So, James is looking at that, the mere profession of faith apart from evidence of works. Uh, Going on to discuss this distinction a little further. So, Paul says that we are justified by faith, whereas James says we are justified for works. And so, Paul, in fact, is stressing the root of justification, whereas James stresses the fruit of justification. Okay, so... Paul's look at the side that says our faith produces justification. James is therefore saying, but if our fruit has truly brought justification, then there should be works on the other side to demonstrate that. And so we could agree. I don't know if I put it up here. No, I don't think I did. But man isn't saved by faith plus works, but by faith that works. Okay, I got it's a little catchy phrase, but I think it's, it, it captures the idea of this, of this discussion, okay? Man isn't saved by faith plus works, but he's saved by faith that works. That is, if you don't live it, then in fact you don't believe it, okay? Uh, when we lived in France, uh, it was very common for many French people to say, je suis croyant non pratiquant, <laughs> and, uh, which means I am, I am a believer, but I'm not a practicing believer, and it's, that's just almost a kind of a nonsensical statement, isn't it? I mean, if you really believe something, I mean, if you firmly believe that something is true, I mean, if in, the, if in your heart of hearts you are convinced of the truth of something, most likely you're gonna, it's going to influence how you live. You're going to practice what you believe, okay? And, uh, but many French people were comfortable saying, hey, listen, no, no, I, I'm a croyant. You know, I believe. Uh, I just don't practice my faith, you know, but God won't hold that against me. Um, both James and Paul would agree that um, if you don't live it, you don't believe it, all right? There, for example, one of the things that Paul wrote in uh, Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5.19, when he says, uh, 5.17, but he says, um, uh, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, Paul would totally agree with the fact that somebody who's truly saved, somebody who has saving faith, is going to show it by a changed life. Okay, they're a new creature, he says. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Even that passage in Ephesians where it says that we're saved by grace through faith and it's not of works, lest any man should both boast. Even in that passage, um, Paul goes on the very following verse to say this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, so it's really clear. Paul makes, it, makes the same statement that if we're truly saved, it's for good works. God has ordained that we practice good works. Okay, that should be the, the natural or obvious result of, uh, of genuine salvation. Um, 
But again, James is just, he's emphasizing that part especially. He's not talking so much about how we are saved, that our, that our faith grants us a position of justification before God, which is true. But James is looking at the other side saying, okay, but once we've been justified before God, if it's save, real saving faith, then there should be some demonstration of it in our lives before men, okay? Um, and so, another way of putting it, um, this was written by Walverd and Zuck. Paul wrote of inner saving faith from God's perspective, while James wrote about outward serving faith from man's perspective. Again, it's like the way that these guys word this, okay? Um, and so the true seed of saving faith is verified by the tangible fruit of serving faith. All right, so saving faith should, in fact, translate into serving faith. And if it doesn't translate into serving faith, then, in fact, it wasn't saving faith to begin with. All right? Uh, now, in Romans chapter 4, this is an interesting uh, um, additional thought here about what James has to say in James chapter 2. In Romans chapter 4, Paul states that Abraham was justified by faith. And, um, and so he even quotes a passage from Genesis chapter 15 where it says that, that, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Okay, he was justified by faith. And Paul picks up on that verse and makes that statement. Abraham was justified by faith. Well, James also refers to Abraham, but listen to what he says. In James chapter 2, verse 21, James says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Ah, okay, that's interesting. So was Abraham justified by faith or by works? Again, it depends if we're looking at the perspective of God or perspective of men. From the perspective of God, Abraham was justified by faith and faith alone. Um, but what's going on here is the very reference to Isaac when James in speaking of Abraham, refers to this part of the story where Abraham offered up his son, okay, or was willing to offer him up as a sacrifice. The very reference to Isaac by James should guard us from any misunderstanding because Abraham's justification by faith, as Paul mentions, was declared in Genesis chapter 15 20 years prior to offering up Isaac. All right, so 20 years before Abraham even got around to offering up Isaac as a sacrifice, James, uh, Abraham was already declared just or righteous by God. Therefore, the man who was justified by works, according to James, had already been justified by faith for 20 years. All right, so again, what they're looking at is Paul saying, in, from God's perspective, at the moment that Abraham believed, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. At that very moment, Abraham was justified on the basis of his faith. 20 years later, when Abraham did this incredible act of being willing to offer up his sacrifice, yes, at that point, the faith that he had in his heart and mind was translated into a physical act that others could see and others did see, and who would say, wow, okay, this guy really believes. I mean, look what he was willing to do. And um, that's what James is talking about. James says, saying when there's saving faith inside, it's going to somehow or another, it's going to spill out and show itself in practical ways that other people who maybe knew that we're churchgoers or knew that we would call ourselves Christians, when they see certain demonstrations of our faith in very challenging situations of life, they're like, Wow, okay, that guy really believes because if I were in his shoes, I wouldn't have acted that way, okay? But the fact that, you know, he was willing to forgive that person who raped his wife or that he was willing to, you know, whatever it is, leave uh, lands and family and so forth and travel halfway across the world to evangelize some unknown people group, um, those are powerful demonstrations of a person's inner faith. And that's what James is talking about, okay? Um, so again, if James had thought that this was some kind of a contradiction with what Paul wrote or what, what Paul and others were teaching, um, he would not have quoted the very verse that tells of Abraham's justification by faith. All right. So again, James knew what he was referring to, and so did Paul. And again, they, their two positions complement one another perfectly. And so here's a good way to summarize this whole discussion is that faith is, 
justifies the man and works justify the faith. Okay? Just another way of saying it perhaps. Maybe the, I don't know if it's the, the best. Maybe that doesn't make as much sense to you as some of the other ones that we've used. But again, faith justifies the man before God and works justify the faith before men. Perhaps it would be better to add those other qualifications in there. All right, so there you go. That's the discussion on, on James chapter 2, and it's a huge, it's a huge and, and valid point okay, to discuss. And, um, and so, again, it's very easily understood in that sense, that they're looking at two different perspectives of faith, but they complement one another. They do not contradict one another. Moving on to chapter 3 of James. Um, so chapter 3, as we already mentioned, James gives this teaching, an extended teaching on the tongue and how to use the tongue. Um, and it is very sobering to see how harmful and damaging the tongue can be when it's being compared, as James does, to a great fire in James chapter 3, verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, okay? So just a small spark is enough to consume uh, a, an entire forest. Or again, it's compared to poison. Our tongue is compared to poison in verse number eight. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Wow, okay, so James isn't holding back here, okay, when he's trying to demonstrate just how important the words that we allow out of our mouth, how important those words are. Again, what what great good those words can do, but also what great harm those words can do. And so again, how important it is for us to weigh out our words um, before we speak. Um, or again, when James uh, points out, okay, it's really striking how James points out that men have been able to tame all the great and fearful beasts of this planet, and yet we're basically powerless to control our own tongues. Uh, and so he says, um, verse 7, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. Uh, and so here's the question. You know, would you rather have a 20-foot python uh, living in your house or someone with an unruly tongue? Well, this text says that we have a better chance of taming the python than we do the unruly tongue, okay? Um, yeah, pretty powerful illustration, right? Or you take any other beast if you want, okay? You'd rather be living with a lion or somebody with an unruly tongue. Again, he says there's more hope that we're going to tame that animal, whatever it is, than we are going to tame that tongue. Um, but James, of course, does present the solution here. And so um, he makes a statement at the end, toward the end of chapter 3. He says in verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the weakness, I'm sorry, in the meekness of wisdom. And so James goes on to say that, in fact, um, what we need is the wisdom of God in order to control our own tongues. And so that is, you know, again, before we speak, Boy, we should take a moment and pray and ask the Lord, Lord, give me wisdom to say the right thing, or maybe to not say anything, okay? Probably in many cases, that would be the better option. But to pray and say, Lord, I need your wisdom in this situation, in this conversation, okay? Before I react, I need your wisdom. He goes on, Paul, uh, James goes on in verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So then Paul goes on to explain what godly language should look like. Okay, and he says it's pure, it's peaceable, it's willing to yield. Okay, it's full of mercy, um, it's sown in peace, etc. Okay, the purpose is to make peace. So Paul, again, does a Oh, Paul, sorry about that. James <laughs> does a great job, again, um, just demonstrating um, how a tongue can be used for good, but the key is to submit it to the Lord. So while it's true that we cannot tame our own tongue, like he says in verse 8, no man can tame the tongue. So it's true, we cannot tame our own tongue, but when we submit our tongue or submit our very selves to the Lord, 
the Lord can tame it. All right, again, like the verse we just uh, referred to earlier, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new, including how we speak. And maybe you know some people, I've heard, I've met, I don't know how many people who have said that once they became a Christian, God changed their language. You know, they may have been a very vulgar person before, you know, constantly using curse words. And once they became a Christian, gone. I mean, God really cleaned, the, cleaned up their language, okay? Um, or people that were very, you know, I knew a man over in France who um, attests that before he became a Christian, he was a very angry person. He could be very hostile, very bitter, very harsh um, in his words. And, um, uh, but when he became a Christian, wow, what a, what a beautiful, wonderful change took place in his life. And uh, as he became, you know, so much more gentle and so much more kind in his words and uh, a genuine, that, that by the way, got the attention of his family, okay? And those who knew, them, knew him the best saw that change. But he would say himself, it was God who brought about that change. He wasn't able to do it, but God did it for him. So um, there we go. When submitted to the Lord, God can tame it and can tame it. And that is indeed our hope in him, not in ourselves. Chapter 4 of James. As James talks about, again, the importance of submitting to God, okay, with a heart of contrition. Um, and so in this chapter, James talks about the way to have victory over the flesh, in the first couple of verses, over the world, verses 4 and 5, and over the devil in verse 7. So we have some mighty adversaries, okay, to our faith, okay, the flesh, the world, and the devil. Uh, they're all going to be opposed, they're all opposed to God, and they're going to be opposed to our uh, desire to live for God. And so the way to have victory over them is to submit ourselves to God. Okay, so that's what Paul, that's what James says in verse chapter 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, so we need to submit to God. Or again, verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Okay, so as we would submit to God and draw closer to God, God will give us the strength and the ability to overcome, again, all these various uh, enemies that are opposed to him. All right, it's kind of in the same light when, it, when we talk about submitting to God, you know, like, what does that mean exactly? But it's kind of in the same way as in Romans chapter 12, um, where Paul says that um, uh, we're to, to uh, offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. So it's the idea of yielding ourselves fully to God, okay? yielding to Him, um, allowing God to call the shots, recognizing Jesus Christ as our genuine, as our one and only and our true Lord and Master. So He's the one that determines what we're going to do and what goals we're going to pursue, etc., and how we're going to handle different situations. All right. And then James goes on to say that as, as we do submit to God, as we do yield to Him, we are then able to enjoy His grace, according to verse 6. God gives more grace, therefore He says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Okay, so as we humble ourselves before God and yield to Him, He gives us His grace. Uh, we get to enjoy His nearness, okay, draw near unto God and He'll draw near to you. Uh, we get to enjoy His goodness. In verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. And we get to enjoy His guidance. Okay, so He gives us clear direction in our lives and helps us to make the right and best decisions as we seek to live our lives for Him. Okay, so really great chapter as far as showing us the way to have victory in our lives and the way to enjoy the fullness of God's blessing. And the bottom, bottom line is we need to submit to God. Okay, humble ourselves before Him. And uh, as we do that, he will lift us up and he will bless us. All right. And then chapter five. Chapter five, there are several important topics that uh, are discussed in this chapter that we'll take a few minutes to look at. Um, first of all, concerning the passage on praying for the sick, which is in chapter five, verses 13 and 15, 13 to 15, we read this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. 
whoa, okay. <laughs> this is a you know, pretty uh, weighty uh, passage here in this book. So concerning this particular topic, this passage here, um, well, first of all, James is basically following general biblical teaching on this topic and says, James agrees with other passages of the Bible, which say that we are to do two things if somebody is sick. We're to pray, but we're also to use means, okay? And the means that James refers to is that of anointing with oil, okay? Which was, at his, excuse me, at, in his day, and still is a medicine, okay? Oil is used medicinally, was very much back then, but still today. Um, for example, then it's the parable of the Good Samaritan, that our Lord Jesus told uh, when the Good Samaritan stopped and helped the guy that was beaten and, and left half dead along the side of the road, it says he poured oil in his wounds. Okay, so he treated him with oil okay, as a medicine. Um, and so the Bible is clear that we should pray for the sick and pursue medical, uh, uh, medical means. Okay, again, it's not one or the other. The Bible makes it clear that both are valid approaches. Both are uh, important and necessary to pray for those who are sick, but also to pursue medical means, doctors, pharmacies, etc. Okay. Now, as for verse 14 itself, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Okay. What is being discussed here? I think I need to advance the slide. Yes. Okay. Several, several observations about this verse. First of all, the word sick. The word sick has the idea of being without strength, okay? So this has in view people who cannot bring themselves to church. So contrary to what is often practiced, where at the end of a church service, the pastor or the healer who is you know, leading the service will say to the people, if you are in need of a healing, come forward and we'll pray over you or perhaps anoint you with oil, whatever, uh, for your healing. Okay, that's not really what this verse has in view. It says, if any of you is without strength, that you, so you are not even strong enough to get into church. Okay, So it says, goes on to say, if that's the case, they are to call for the elders to come to them. All right. So again, in many circles today, it's the elders calling to the sick to come to the elders. This verse says the opposite. It says the sick person who can't get to church is supposed to call for the elders to come to him. All right. So... Um, and then the elders are to pray over that person. And so, again, in this verse, the main verb in verse 14, it says, let them pray over him. The main verb is to pray over them. The, the verb anointing or the participle anointing is a, you know, a helping verb here, but it's not the main verb. Okay? It's not the principal verb. And so um, the word anoint is used not in the sense, in the sacred sense of anointing, like, you know, they would anoint um, somebody that was going to be a, a king or a prophet, okay? It's not used in that sense. It's not the word that's used in that sense, okay? There's several different words in Greek. One of them, when it's translated anoint, has that sacred sense. Uh, in fact, the name of Christ, okay, comes from that very word, um, krio, which has the idea of the sacred anointing. Okay, that's the name of Christ. He's the anointed one, all right? But there's another verb in Greek, which James uses here, and it's not that one there. It's like krio. He uses a different verb, which actually means to rub. Okay, you're anointing in the sense of applying an oil to the person. Okay, but it's not a christening. It's not an anoint, a sacred anointing. It's an idea of applying it as a medicine. It's, it's even, it actually means to friction or to rub the oil in. And so this is the idea of applying oil as they would a medicine. So the elders are to come and pray over this person. That's the main verb. But also anointing with oil to the extent that this could have some medicinal benefit for the individual who's sick. All right. So what's the meaning or the application then of this particular verse for us? Well, it's in fact, it's again a confirmation that prayer should accompany but not replace medicinal means. Okay? The Bible is nowhere opposed to the use of medicine or medical treatments, including the application of oil in order to treat illness. All right. So um, again, prayer and medicine go hand in hand in the Word of God. Um, moving on then, in answer to the question, 
Well, is it ever God's will for a believer to have a prolonged illness? And looking at this passage, it's talking to Christians and it's saying, you know, if any of you are sick. Um, so is it possible for a believer to have a prolonged illness? And the answer, of course, is a resounding yes. Okay. Uh, God allows sickness in a believer's life for various reasons and even in the life of faithful believers. Okay. So there are examples in the Bible of those who were very faithful, serving, godly Christians who still became very sick, some to the point of death even. And so uh, Paul uh, talks about his sickness, his thorn in the flesh, which appears from the different texts, appears to have been some kind of a physical ailment. Um, but that weighed upon him and that God, even though he prayed for it several times, God did not remove it. Um, Paul also refers to a gentleman by the name of Epaphroditus, one of his faithful co-workers and uh, just a godly servant of God. And he talks about how Epaphroditus became near to death. He became sickly, you know, uh, deathly sick, I should say, um, in service to God. It was, it was in serving God that he became very ill. And, um, and he says, now God did have mercy upon him and spare his life then, and he became better. But for a time, he was very, very sick. Um, and then uh, in Timothy, Paul talks about another of his um, uh, co-workers, and he makes the comment that he left him, uh, his name was Trophimus, and he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, referring to this faithful co-workers of his, he says, um, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. So here's one of Paul's, you know, cherished co-workers, and Paul couldn't heal him, and yet Paul had the gift of healing, at least for a good part of his ministry, but, um, but he, he left them sick, okay? So God allows sickness even in the life of, um, of faithful believers, okay? And when he does that, obviously there's a purpose to it. God doesn't do it capriciously, um, and it's not just a, it's a, like a random, it's just so, so, you know, so I got sick, God didn't really have anything to do with it, or, or didn't know what was going to happen to me. Um, even through sickness, God has a purpose and uh, something he's desiring to accomplish in our lives or maybe through us, okay? Putting us in a position, being sick, we have to go see a doctor or go to a hospital uh, or be treated by certain people that we would never see otherwise. And so God clearly is allowing us the opportunity to witness to those individuals. And um, the only time that might be difficult to witness is like for me, the one time I was in the hospital was with a broken jaw. And so they had to wire my mouth shut. And so that made it a little bit more challenging for me to use that opportunity to witness to people when my mouth was wired shut. But you know what? Even then, um, got put on my heart. And so the doctor who operated on me, I wrote a, an evangelistic letter and gave it to that doctor um, since I couldn't talk to him, but uh, gave an evangelistic letter to read um, with the gospel in it. So, yeah, God can use sickness for his glory, which he says so much in John chapter 9 and John chapter 11. Two occasions when he healed the uh, gentleman that was born blind, and then John chapter 11, when he uh, raised Lazarus from the dead, he says how those were intended to bring glory to God. Hmm. Okay, so sickness can bring glory to God, according to Jesus, right? All right, um, and then uh, a final, oops, that's not it, it's next paragraph. Uh, final consideration here, the very last verses of James. I'll go to read in verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. All right, so concerning this final warning that James gives, um, he appears to be referring to a child of God. First of all, because this book is addressed to um, believers. And in this, very, in this very passage, he starts out by saying, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. So it seems to be that he has Christians in view here, okay? But this is a Christian who has gone astray. And again, does that ever happen? <laughs> yeah, sadly it does. And there's many examples in the Bible of that happening. Um, for example, Luke, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, Peter says to uh, James, <laughs> all right, <laughs> I got too many names rolling around my head, right? In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says to Peter, um, that he tells him he's going to deny him shortly. And, um, and then 
Jesus says to Peter, but when you are converted, he says, but I prayed for you so that your faith will not fail. And he says, when you're converted, he says, go strengthen your brethren, right? So Jesus said he was going to intercede for Peter. Thankfully, he did for Peter and he does for us as well so that our faith does not fail. But then he says to Peter, when you are converted, and it's the same Greek word as James uses here, okay? If someone turns him back, it's the same Greek word as what Jesus used to Peter, all right? So again, Peter's um, salvation was never in question. Jesus says, I prayed for you so your faith would not fail. But that didn't keep Peter from denying the Lord. So Peter definitely strayed from the Lord for a time there. And, um, but Jesus was concerned with Peter's conversion, not for salvation, but the fact that he would turn back to the Lord. Okay, because that's what the word conversion means is converted means to turn away uh, or to turn back rather. Okay, so Peter was going to turn back to the right path. That's what James is saying. Somebody's wandered from the Lord. We need to turn him back to the Lord. Okay, not that he lost his salvation, but what he is saying when it says um, that you save a soul from death, yeah, because the Bible in this type, in this case, is talking about physical death. Okay, if you turn that person back from the error of the way, so they turn back to the Lord, it says you save the soul from death. Okay, it's not talking about spiritual death. Not talking about them losing their salvation. It's talking about physical death. That is indeed, sometimes God will shorten a life of a person when a believer chooses to live in sin. And again, there are various passages that talk about that, especially in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul is discussing the, the, the Lord's Supper. And he says right in there, he says, if anybody uh, takes of this drink or takes of this um, bread unworthily, he says, uh, he'll be judged by the Lord. And he says, and for this reason, some of you, are sick and some have fallen asleep, some have died. Paul says some of those believers died because they were partaking in the Lord's Supper unworthily, okay? That is, without, uh, with unconfessed sin, all right? Without taking seriously their relationship with God and the sacrifice of Christ for them. It wasn't that they weren't believers or that they, and that, that they weren't saved, but at that time in their lives, they were kind of making a mockery of that um, of their relationship with the Lord. They were, they, there was a stain upon that relationship that they were not willing, willing to deal with. And so they were living hypocritically. And so after a time, the Bible says, God, he'll send chastisements to get their attention, which could be sickness, for example. But eventually God can remove the life of a believer, not their salvation, but he can remove, he can shorten their life. Okay. They, they die earlier than they should have. And so, um, yeah, uh, Paul talks about that. And that's what James was talking about earlier when he says the prayer of the faith will save the sick. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Okay. It's talking in about this idea that sickness can be one of God's chastisements if indeed there's sin involved. And, um, and so the key then is to confess our sins to the Lord because he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that chastisement can be removed. All right. And that's why also in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Okay, so God doesn't, doesn't desire to judge us. He's not looking to, to throw some chastisement upon us, but we have, to be, we have to evaluate ourselves and be willing to judge ourselves and deal with any sin that's in our lives and confess it and turn away from it um, so that we can receive God's uh, mercy and blessing. All right, so there you go. James, man, touches on a lot of different issues. Again, very, very practical issues. Um, and so last time we concluded with this poem, which I'd like to just quote it again. I think it does a, a great job, a poetic job of, um, of summarizing uh, the basic teaching of James. And so here we go, closing with this poem. We are saved by faith, yet faith is one with life, like daylight and the sun. Unless they flower in our deeds, dead, empty husks are all the creeds. To call Christ Lord, but strive not to obey, belies the homage that with words I pay. So I like that uh, this poem by Maud Fraser Jackson, fitting way to finish our study today. So again, I really want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I really do encourage you, as always, to go back and read or reread the entire book of James, just to appreciate all the different details and and uh, nuances that come out of the text as you take time to read and meditate on God's Word.
So I do want to thank you for joining us. Uh, next time, Lord willing, we'll be looking at the book of Peter as we work our way through this New Testament survey. But until then, uh, may the Lord keep you and may he bless you. Just give you a great week. And in fact, this Sunday, um, if you're watching these, uh, these studies in real time, this coming Sunday is Easter. And so I do want to wish you just a really happy and blessed Easter. God be with you. See you next time. Thanks.